Good evening, New Prospect. Welcome to our Wednesday night prayer and Bible study. We want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, if we have any first-time guests or visitors, we want to welcome you uh, and thank you for sharing your evening with us as we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through prayer and Bible study. My name is Josh Cruz. I'm the associate pastor here, and we're going to hear from Senior Pastor Brady Willis shortly. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, maybe you're wondering who we are, what we do, and what we believe here at New Prospect Baptist Church. We'd invite and encourage you to check out our Facebook page. You can learn a great deal about our family of faith there. Uh, but feel free to also give us a call here at the church office or send us an email. We would love to speak with you and answer any questions you might have. But thank you guys so much again for tuning in. Before we jump into Bible study, we do want to open it up uh, for a time of uh, prayer. We would love to be praying for you. Perhaps you have uh, a request that we could add to our list. We would love to do that. Uh, you can simply respond to this Facebook feed, uh, and we can get that request added. But uh, at this time, let's go ahead and take a look at tonight's prayer list. Looking at our prayer list this week, we have several uh, updates we want to make you aware of. Mr. Johnny Long, listed under Lynchburg General Hospital, we added his name this week. I do believe Mr. Johnny Long is in Virginia Baptist Hospital now. We want to continue to remember him, uh, and uh, we want to continue to pray for Miss Casey Wageman as she is in Lynchburg General battling COVID. Uh, please remember her. I also understand that Mr. G.B. Reynolds has passed away, uh, so we want to remember the family of Mr. G.B. Reynolds. Listed under Roanoke Memorial, Jacob Hildrup, he was um, uh, he was admitted to Lynchburg or, or Roanoke Memorial this week. Uh, so we want to continue to remember him and his parents as they seek answers and comfort uh, for Jacob during this time. Others listed here, we want to continue to remember them as well. Uh, we have many members listed at home. I know Margie had a... Uh, a test run this past week, and we want to remember her. Uh, Donna Lewitsky is currently under quarantine. We want to remember her. And, of course, uh, many of you know Miss Kim Moore and, uh, and Miss, Mrs. Nancy Wilson were added this week as they are battling COVID. We want to lift them up in our prayers as well. Lots of family and friends listed here, each one with a specific need. Let us continue to uh, remember each one of those this week. We're expressing sincere Christian symp sympathy to the families of Mrs. Linda Santmeyer, and that was Carolyn Allen's sister. So please remember this family as they grieve the loss of a loved one this week. Our homebound of the week is Mr. Ben Allen, and uh, our student of the week is Stephen Dollyheit. If you get the chance to be the presence of Christ in their lives this week, please do so. Uh, give them a card. Uh, give them a phone call uh, or text message, let them know that their family of faith is thinking of them and lifting them up in prayer. Uh, let's also remember those in other assisted living facilities and rehabilitation facilities as well. And now that these requests have been made known, would you please bow with me in a moment of prayer as we lift them up. Lord, we come to you today and we thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to share life together through the voicing of the concerns on our hearts. Lord, so many in our community and, Lord, our church family and uh, throughout the area that are suffering, Lord, uh, with sickness and different ailments, Lord, and so many are grieving the loss of a loved one. Lord, we lift each one to you. We pray that you would meet them where they are, Lord, that you would reassure them of your love and your care for each one and that you would guide and direct them in the days ahead. And, Lord, as we dive deeper into your word, Lord, we pray for, um, Lord, a discernment of that word. Lord, that you would speak to us through it. Lord, that we would uh, gain greater knowledge of who you are and that you would instill your wisdom in us to go outside these four walls and be your hands and feet. Lord, we praise you, we thank you, we love you, and we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Good evening. I uh, hope all of you are doing well and uh, have uh, been able to stay healthy for the most part and are ready to study the Bible this evening. 
And we're still, of course, in the book of Daniel. And so I invite you to get your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 8. And this evening, uh, we will be studying verses 1 through 14. Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that had appeared to me earlier. I saw the vision, and as I watched, I was in the fortress city of Susa, in the province of Elam. I saw in the vision that I was beside the Ulai Canal. I looked up, and there was a ram standing beside the canal. He had two horns. The two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, and the longer one came up last. I saw the ram charging to the west, the north, and the south. No animal could stand against him, and there was no rescue from his power. He did whatever he wanted and became great. As I was observing, a male goat appeared coming from the west across the surface of the entire earth without touching the ground. The goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came toward the two-horned ram I had been standing beside, that had been standing beside the canal and rushed at him with savage fury. I saw him approaching the ram and infuriated with him, he struck the ram, shattering his two horns, and the ram was not strong enough to stand against him. The goat threw him to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat became very great, but when he became powerful, the large horn was shattered. Four conspicuous horns came up in its place, pointing toward the four winds of heaven. From one of them, a little horn emerged and grew extensively toward the south and the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew as high as the heavenly host, made some of the stars and some of the host fall to the earth and trampled them. It made itself great even up to the prince of the host, it removed his daily sacrifice and overthrew the place of his sanctuary. Because of rebellion, a host, together with the daily sacrifice, will be given over. The horn will throw truth to the ground and will be successful in whatever it does. Then I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to the speaker, How long will the events of this vision last? The daily sacrifice, the rebellion that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and of the host to be trampled. He said to me, For 2300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for allowing us to gather this way. We're so grateful to you, Lord, for the technology that can be used uh, for the benefit of your people. We ask, Father, that as we study the text this evening, that you would guide us and direct us. And that somehow, Lord, even though these words are sometimes, often, oftentimes hard to understand, that through your spirit speaking to us, we will gain some knowledge of them. We ask now, Lord, uh, that as we commit ourselves to study, uh, that you will honor our faithfulness. For we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we look at this text, one of the things I need to tell you, uh, and I may have told you last week, but in chapter 2 through, verses seven, through chapter 7, uh, the text of Daniel 
is written in Aramaic. It's basic, the, basically the speaking language of uh, the people at a particular time in the life uh, of the Jews. We know uh, pretty well certain uh, that Aramaic was the language that Jesus spoke. Beginning with chapter 8 and going forward to the end of the book of Daniel, what we'll be studying is are the words of the prophet that were written in Hebrew, which was more or less the religious language of the people. And so here we are, we're looking at this text, and in some ways, in some ways, chapter 8 serves as, some believe, as a commentary on chapter 7. In other words, what, we, what we're studying in chapter 8 is, for the most part, parallel to what we previously studied in chapter 7. And so we began in this text in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. You'll recall uh, in chapter 7, it began with the first year of Belshazzar's reign. And of course, the third year would put it at about 550 to 549 B.C. In chapter 7, if you go back and you look at chapter 7, you will discover a little bit of a difference between the vision there and the vision here. One of the things that you would notice is that in that chapter, Daniel says, or seems to be, in Babylon. In this chapter, it says that I saw the vision, and so I watched, and I was in the fortress city of Susa, and the prom province of Elam. But if, if you look at that verse in verse 2, what you will discover is the, the word Saul is repeated several times, or the, 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 the word look, sort of parallel words there. And so the su suggestion is that when Daniel says that he was in Susa, that he is speaking in uh, a spiritual, in spiritual terms. Let me give you a sort of a parallel thing in the prophetic book that appears right before Daniel in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel uh, chapter 8, verses, uh, verse 3b, let me uh, tell you what you read there. He stretched out what appeared to be a hand and took me by the hair of my head. Then the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and carried me in visions of God to Jerusalem. So the idea here is that that idea that in Ezekiel, Ezekiel is carried in visions to Jerusalem that what Daniel is saying here is that sort of in this vision, he was taken to Susa. Now, one of the things we need to know is Susa is 230 miles to the east of Babylon, and it's 120 miles to the north of the Persian Gulf. If you want to know uh, something important about Susa, uh, one of the important things is that the law code of Hammurabi which is a very famous archaeological find, it was discovered in Susa. In your Bible, I don't know what you're reading from, what, uh, what uh, translation you're reading from. I'm reading, of course, from the Holman Christian Study Bible. Uh, my text read uh, that he found himself uh, beside the Eula Canal. Uh, maybe your translation said the River Eula. But one of the things that you uh, need to know is that this canal, it was really a canal, and it was an artificial canal. It had been, it had been made. In verse 3, uh, we read what he saw when he got there. It's almost like this is where the vision is beginning. I looked up, and there was a ram standing beside the canal. He had two horns. The two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, and the longer one came up last. Uh, now, he's, he talked about a, a ram, a ram, two horns, 
one was longer and came up last. And what this is referring to are the kingdoms of Media and Persia. And at one time they were, they were sort of the big, you know, together. They brought them together. Uh, the kingdom of the Medes uh, sort of uh, was a preeminent one at one time. And then Persia rose up and they became one. And under Cyrus of Persia, Persia became the most dominant of the two. And so this is what the two horns are speaking of. Uh, in that third verse. And then it goes on to say in verse 4. I saw the ram charging to the west, north, and south. No animal could stand. And it said no rescue. He did whatever he wanted. And be became great. It's interesting that if you go back to once again to the book of Ezekiel. Discover that uh, the ram in Ezekiel is the male of the flock. And it typically uh, it uh, refers to oppressive rulers. Now notice that this ram is shown to be, or, or said to be, constantly charging in three directions. And if you look at the history of Persia, Persia being what is now in the area of what is now Iran, if you look at what took place in Persia, that you, what you will discover is that Cyrus and his successors defeated Syria, they defeated Babylon, uh, and uh, those were in one direction to the west. They defeated Armia, Armenia, excuse me, and Lydia, which were to the north, and Egypt and Ethiopia, which were to the south. And so what we discover, if you look at all that is taking place, what they're talking about the ram and what it was able to accomplish, uh, what it is uh, reminding us of is that the Medo-Persian Empire grew to become geographically the greatest empire the world had known up until that time. So this is a great empire. It is the power of the known world at that time. And then, but then we have to come uh, to verses 5 through 8. And it says, as I was observing, a male goat appeared coming from the west across across the surface of the entire earth without touching the ground. That um, without touching the ground suggests um, a rapid conquest. If, if you're not touching the ground, have you ever, have you ever um, uh, read of somebody or somebody described somebody uh, as running so fast that it, it almost seemed as if their feet weren't touching the ground? And this is the way this conquest took place. It was, it was very rapid. It, it, you know, it, it took place very quickly. Now, so we're, we're reading of a male goat, and we're told that this male goat was from the West. So what do you think this is referring to? Well, what great country uh, ended up being to the West of the Medo-Persian Empire? Well, it was Greece. The male goat is Greece. And if you want to know what the horn was, the horn represents Alexander the Great. And if you go back and you study the history of Western civilization, uh, you discover that Alexander the Great is a central figure. And one of the things he did is in 334 BC, he moved across the Hellespont and he defeated Darius III at Issus, and that took place in 333 B.C. Now, in, in my text, it said, He came toward the two-horned ram. I had been standing beside, I, I had seen standing beside the canal and rushed at him with savage fury. And, and one of the things that we do know is that over time, uh, the Greeks uh, became to have somewhat of a great hatred uh, for the Persians because uh, they were constantly at tension with one another. And this, they were quarreling with one another. And so <clears throat> eventually, uh, you know, not only uh, were the Greeks uh, very powerful, but when they came into battle against uh, the Persians, they... They also had that emotional hate. Maybe 
you've seen that, you know, somebody uh, is sort of lit on fire because of their uh, disdain for someone or something. Now, in, in verse 7, uh, we came to verse 7, we read, I saw him approaching the ram and infuriated with him, he struck the ram, shattering his two horns, and the ram was not strong enough to stand against him. The goat threw him to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one to rescue the ram from his power. Now, if you, if you were to read the history of uh, Alexander the Great's military campaigns, uh, you know, they're, they're, they are somewhat detailed. Uh, and Daniel isn't really, uh, you know, here to give us really uh, every historical facet of what is taking place. He's giving us a little bit of an overview, trying to make a point to us. And so he doesn't give us the specifics of military battles and Alexander's campaign against the Medo-Persian Empire. But what he says is the goat threw him to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one to rescue the ram from his power. Now, if you do study it just a little bit, what you will discover is uh, that there were three basic battles that took place between, or, or big battles that took place uh, between the Greeks and the Medo-Persians. The final battle took place in 330 B, 331 B.C. in Gagamela. And in that place, uh, Darius the uh, Third was really smashed. His forces were smashed. He ended up being captured uh, and he was actually assassinated by one of his governmental figures, the satraps. And so what that did, that final battle in 331 BC, it ended all of Persian resistance. And so you think, oh man, oh man, Alexander has it made, you know, and he does. He goes on, uh, and if you study a little bit, you'll discover like he went into Egypt uh, and the, the, Egypt, the Egyptians, who apparently had a, somewhat of a rough time uh, under the Persians, they welcomed Alexander. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they, you know, they just said, yeah, come on in. They thought things would be better under him than they were under the Persians. And, of course, one of the great cities of Egypt became Alexandria. And you can guess how it came to be named that. But it's interesting, in, in verse 8, it says, when the horn became powerful, well, when the, the goat became powerful, the large horn was shattered. And, you know, it's very fascinating uh, that Alexander became uh, the king of... His, his father uh, was murdered, was assassinated. Philip of Macedon, they were Macedonian. Uh, and, uh, and Alexander became king, ruler, at the age of 20. From about that time forward, uh, he was on military campaigns and apparently never, never returned to his hometown. And he was constantly fighting battles, it, 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 expanding, expanding the borders of, of his kingdom. And it was like when he came to the end of uh, the kingdom or, or his battles, he... he he was overwrought but that there were no more worlds to conquer. The fascinating thing is that Alexander dies in 323 B.C. at the age of either 32 of, or 33. Now, you, now, one of the things that we do know, of course, is that as Alexander uh, conquered peoples and countries that what he was, one of his primary focuses was not just making them suburb, suburb <laughs> making them under his rule, there you go. Uh, you know, he, he wasn't just trying to trample them down, he was also trying to bring them up. And he thought the best way that he could to bring people up was to spread Greek culture to them. And so that if you look at the ancient world, you will discover that the, one of the major influences on the ancient world 
was Hellenism. And it, it, it spread all over and it, it impacted all different areas like language and education and in some cases, religion. And so you can see his influence was lasting. But I, I, I think it's fascinating that as the, the, the writer of Daniel is describing the battles took place, how they, how they do it. I like what Joyce Baldwin writes. In her commentary, she writes, The sight and sounds of horns breaking off typifies the brittle nature of political might. Especially as the goat had his great horn broken when he was strong. The audiovisual impact of the vision has continuing relevance. Great power resulting in self-importance invites a great reversal. I hope you got that. Well, I'll, I'll read it one more time. The sight and sounds of horns breaking off typifies the brittle nature of political might, especially as the goat had his great horn broken when he was strong. The audiovisual impact of the vision has continuing relevance. Great power resulting in self-importance invites a great reversal. And this is something that wasn't just true uh, back uh, 24, 25, 2600 years ago. It is true today that really uh, political power is brittle in its nature. And, and so uh, the people who govern even in a country like ours, which is a republic, uh, you know, that is much different uh, than than the empires of, of that we're reading about in the book of Daniel, that we have to understand that, that every time that someone uh, believes that they have absolute power, they have to be very careful uh, because political might is very brittle in nature. Uh, we went on to read, He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the low, lowly. This is, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it it's, talks about four conspicuous horns coming up and uh, in its place. And I'm pointing toward the four uh, winds of heaven. So uh, what, what took place here uh, is that after, uh, and we talked about this in chapter 7, after Alexander's death, uh, for the most part, after some time, um, what happened was his empire was split up between uh, generals. And, and what happened uh, was that these generals uh, had power in certain parts of what had been Alexander's empire. This all happened after the Battle of Ipsus, which took place in 301 B.C. Cassander uh, took over Ma what was Macedonia and Greece, Lysimachus, uh, took over Thrace and Asia Minor. Uh, Ptolemy I took over Egypt, and Seleucus I uh, took over Syria and Babylonia. And so that is the setting right there. It, you know, he's, he's getting you that setting. Uh, Daniel is and what he's brought us to is the point uh, he's taken us through uh, and it, it's interesting remember in the other one he, he talks about four different empires and even when you go back to chapter 2 they, they talk about the four empires and in chapter 8 he basically focuses on two empires uh, that being the Persian empire and then uh, the, the empire of Alexander that follows it and he brings us to the point uh, where this goat with the horn, the horn is broken off. And out of it, these other four uh, uh, just areas or, or powers rise up. But he's bringing us to a point where, the, where his primary focus is. is. And in my, uh, in my Bible, it talks about the little horn. 
and it talks about this little horn and it says uh, from one of them, in other words, out of these four, one of them, a little horn emerged and grew extensively toward the south and the east and toward the beautiful land, the beautiful land. And, uh, you know, as as we as we think about this, that beautiful land has to be Palestine. Uh, there, there could be no other. Uh, now, the little, the little horn uh, is that it, because we'll be able to read what he does and, and how, how he relates to God. Um, the little horn is Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, the Slukin king. And we read about this in chapter 7 as well, but uh, in 168 B.C., Antiochus forced forces looted the temple and and later on he overthrew the high priest and actually for more than three years Antiochus took over the worship of the temple and um and it's it's showing how you know back here earlier we're reading of all of these battles that are taking place between the kingdoms between Persia and between Greece and now we're encountering how there is this battle taking place between man and God and so as this is unfolding as he's doing all of this stuff and as he's rebelling and everything else uh, it it says um, that uh, then I heard a holy one speaking in another holy wait let me go back to chapter verse 12 excuse me because of rebellion, a host together with the daily sacrifice will be given over. Will be given over. The horn will throw truth to the ground and will be successful in whatever it does. I hope you heard that. He will throw truth to the ground. Uh, one commentator says in, in our vernacular, we might say that truth was dragged in the mud. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes... In our land, truth gets dragged in the mud from time to time. The truth was dragged in, in, in the mud. It was thrown to the ground. And, uh, and we do know that Antiochus did all of these hor horrible things. We know that, uh, uh, you know, he, he displaced uh, uh, the, the God Yahweh, the worship of God with his own gods or with the gods of other people. Uh, you know, we, it is said that he... Uh, he uh, he uh, poured pig's broth on the altar, which was an abomination. And and here it is. It looks like he's he's won. You know, it looks like he's won and everything. But then you get down here in verse thirteen. It reads, "Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the speaker, How long will the events?" of this vision last the daily sacrifice the rebellion that makes desolate and the giving over of the sanctuary and of the host to be trampled and here's the answer he said to me for 2300 evenings and mornings then the sanctuary will be restored and uh, so as we look at this uh, you notice you notice that the question of the Holy One, then I heard a Holy One speaking, and another Holy One said to the speaker, how long will the events... Notice he doesn't say, why are these things taking place? He, he's not saying, why are these thing, things taking place? He wants to know how long they're going to take place. And the other speaker gives the answer, he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings in the sanctuary will be restored. And so you take that and you divide that by 2, 2300, and you come up with 1150, right? Of course, do the math. And so if you, if you do that, uh, and then you uh, multiply 365 times 3, you will discover uh, that a little bit more uh, than three uh, years that all of this would be happening. And you go back and you study uh, the history and you find out that indeed uh, Antiochus Epiphanes 
was able to do all these horrific things uh, for about three and a half years uh, until uh, what was called the Maccabean Revolt took place. Uh, and then uh, at that, after the Maccabees, uh, you know, uh, threw them out and everything, uh, the temple worship was restored. And so this is uh, one, one of the things, I, I guess, one of the, the, the lessons, if we can take, um, if we can take something from the text of Daniel this, this evening and, and say, make it applicable to our own experiences, is that uh, it, though, though evil seems to uh, be winning, and I'm not talking about today, I'm talking about any day, there's many times evil is thought to be winning. The Bible always says that God will limit its reign and, uh, you know, that good will eventually prevail because God will eventually pre prevail. You notice that in the book of Daniel, there's no sense uh, that God isn't sovereign. Uh, there's this, as, as Daniel is seeing this vision and everything is unfolding, uh, it, it looks like, uh, through all of these verses and everything that that people uh, basically control the destiny of the world you know uh, you have the Persian Empire and it rises up and it it goes out and it defeats all of these folks and it takes over and it is the power in the world uh, and then all of a sudden you see Alexander the Great and he is conquering all every space of what was then known uh, as, uh, as, as the known world, the civilized world or, or whatever. And he spreads Greek culture and all of that. And, and then you see his kingdom being divided up. And then uh, out of the four, uh, there rises one that is the most prominent and that ends up being uh, the Seleucid king, Antiochus Epiphanes. And it looks like for a while that he is, he is the power. And he almost makes himself want to be worshipped and, uh, and, and you can understand, you can understand why in, uh, in, in the early church in the first century, uh, one of the, one of the things that, uh, we, we do find in, um, the struggle between Christians, uh, and the rest of the world, especially the world that was, um, at that time controlled by Rome is that there was, this cult of Caesar worship, where Caesar was actually worshipped as a god. And one of the things that, that the Christians refused to do was to work, they, they refused to worship Caesar as God. Uh, as, as one of the commandments tells us, you shall have no other gods before me, right? And uh, so the Christians refused that. And, and really for that, that thing, their refusal to worship Caesar, Caesar. Many, in many cases, that's why they were punished. And in truth, in truth, all through time, uh, Christian folk ha have done this, this same thing. Uh, whenever Caesar demands our primary loyalty, in other words, whenever Caesar says, I'm going to have first place in your life, we understand at that point, Caesar is trying to become an idol or a god to us. And as followers of Jesus, uh, we resist, we resist that temptation. Because let's face it, let's face it, uh, there is the temptation for us to worship, uh, worship a ruler, to worship a country, uh, to put something else above God. And in our text, in as we go through this and everything else, you can understand why maybe the book of Daniel was very important to the early church when it faced persecution. And it, it makes it understandable as well why you see um, parallel um, types of um, things in the, in the book of Revelation that you do in the book of Daniel. So what we are called to do is to remain faithful even in trying times. Uh, and uh, we're still, uh, Daniel's having these visions and he's looking out 
there and he's seeing these troubled times uh, and he's wondering, you know, how long is this going to last? And, um, and yet his confidence, his confidence comes from knowing that God is sovereign. And that's what we should have as well. So uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for allowing us to study it once again. Uh, we, we thank you, God, for the message that it uh, brings to us this evening. Father, we, we understand that political power is indeed brittle uh, and uh, that political people uh, often uh, assume that uh, they are the ultimate authority. But God, as our text has reminded us this evening, uh, you are the one who is sovereign. Yes, there are going to be occasions when, when other people and other powers are, are going to try to uh, ask us for uh, our primary affection. But help us, O oh God, help us, O oh God, to worship only one and that one be you. Help us to be faithful in our own day. Uh, as Daniel was in his. For we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you once again for coming and studying the book of Daniel with me. And uh, we're, we're making our way through it. And uh, God bless you. If you have any questions that you would like to ask me uh, about our study, uh, feel free to either contact us by way uh, of the internet or, or give me a call. Or uh, I'll tell you... Um, uh, this, this, even this day, uh, Ed Kazee asked me a question about the book of Daniel uh, while he was here and came up into the office. So I uh, invite those questions. I'm not sure I will always have the answers, uh, but occasionally I will. So God bless you. Look forward to next week.